Right, preparing the live stream meeting. So now we have got to know what we're doing because we're live. <laughs> Share. Give some dance to you. No, I made our own group chat. Oh, Right, so we're just going to wait a couple of minutes and then Alex is going to message us when to start. Okay, sounds good. Okay, that's people starting to come in now. So I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes and then we will start the presentation. I'll do a wee intro. That's because it closed. Okay, we'll just message after. <laughs> Uh, just for anyone who's just joining now, we're just going to wait a couple of minutes before we have more of our members in, and then we'll speak in just a second. We'll start the lecture in a second.
Okay, so we'll get started. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to our first 5710 of the year. I'm Ronan and this is Damien. If anyone has any concerns about our health, don't worry, we do actually have the pleasure of living together. So we're allowed to be this close to each other and to be in the same room. Um, as this is our first like uh, online lecture, bear with, it, with us through any technical difficulties, but hopefully everything will run smoothly. Um, I'd like to introduce Louisa. Uh, she is a recent architecture graduate. Uh, she did a placement in Washington and had her thesis project exhibited at the Royal Scottish Academy. Um, most recently, she's turned her hand to art. So I'll hand over to let her speak for herself now. Um, if you have any questions for Louisa, just pop them in the comments section of the YouTube channel or on the Teams group. But I'll pass you over to Louisa and you can just share your screen now and we'll mute ourselves yeah. in. That's fine. Hi everyone. My name is Louisa and I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, no, I'm not. Yes, I am. I never have to do this, thankfully. Uh, okay, share. Uh, and I'm going to go full screen. Is that all good? Yes. Thumbs up if, if it's all full screen. It is fab. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to go over basically a small timeline of first year all the way through to where I'm at now, but I'll only touch on um, my kind of part one and my year in industry because I feel like that's less less important as, as time goes on and there's more things that have taken over. Um, so I did my BA ordinary at Dundee, uh, first to third year. Uh, and I'll chat about that briefly and then I went and I moved to Washington DC when I was 20 um, and that's where I did my part one placement not a traditional part one because obviously the US system is completely different uh, to the UK um, and then I'll touch a little bit on my fourth year um, project my you know your like main key project I don't know if uh, RGU is slightly different to um, Dundee but we do our we get our degree that year and then the fifth year is our master's uh, thesis it might be the exact same um, and then I will chat about when I went to work at HG straight after uni as a part two and then my subsequent job that I was moving to New York um, in January or it was meant to be March so obviously we all know what happened and I didn't make it uh, and then I'll chat about my new business art station which is I'm based kind of Glasgow Edinburgh London just bouncing about and I'll chat to you about what I've basically been doing um pretty much since March and then at the end we'll have a wee Q&A if anyone has any um specific questions that they want to ask um, so I just thought I'd start the series with how I always start every project, which is scribbling. And I basically always, always sketch everything. So first to third year, this is basically how I started every single project. This is an A1 sheet. And I basically gridded it up and just started putting all my ideas out. And um, that's just how I approach every project. And it was until I um, went and did my year out. And then I kind of steadied and I kind of focused a bit more on a bit more traditional sketching and things like that but this was just how I got all my um ideas I did site analysis everything um using this kind of style um and so that was first to third year I was just quite a chilled student we we're just having fun so I wasn't super serious about anything at this point and um yeah it was a, it was a good a good fun three years and then we all went and did our year out in America these are not cute pics but they're the pics that I could find so um I moved to Washington DC in August after finishing I guess in May um I, I worked at Jacobs which is like basically an engineering like uh, it's like an engineering firm but they have architects yeah, mechanical structural sales marketing they do a lot of stuff um and I basically top right image is my conversion chart because I needed to always switch between metric and imperial they all thought I was a genius though because I knew metric and all that they were like wow and um, always very impressed um I joined the American Institute of Architects and I worked as a graphic designer while I was out there as well as a side job kind of thing for the AIA where I was doing the design awards uh, all the graphics for that um, and that was in Alexandria and Virginia so I would travel a little bit from DC just to to keep that up uh, top left is just basically images of 
um, the fact that I think it's always very important to keep trying to sketch, colour, draw, paint, do whatever you can at a desk because, you know, industry will just um, bring you down a little bit on that and they don't really want you to be creative and I think it's quite important to try and stay on top of that. Um, bottom right, I worked at a lot of projects uh, but one of them was the International Monetary Fund which is where I was doing a lot of measuring so, you know, basically just do a lot of measuring uh, surveys and things like that um, I worked for the Department of Defense made immune which is pharmaceutical stuff um, I did three projects on the Pentagon and we went behind the scenes at the Capitol building so we did I did a lot of work um, on these kind of projects and then a lot of undisclosed projects which I'm not allowed to still not allowed to talk about it and couldn't put it on my PDR sheets so all of my PDR was undisclosed which was great but um these were like 3.8 million square feet projects you know huge big companies that you'll all have heard of and basically I just wasn't allowed to disclose it so anyway that was my year out uh, very different to maybe a year in practice in the UK so I didn't necessarily know exactly what it was going to be like when I graduated and worked in Scotland in architecture or the UK uh, so then I went back to uni in fourth year. This is just like a more traditional project that I did in Dundee. I did the Dundee Central Library. This was like my big main project where you do everything from structural, tons of group work. It's all just like quite a traditional fourth year project. And um, I designed a kind of central library bringing together the students and then the poor parts of uh, Dundee. Um, and it was meant to be like the traditional kind of bookshelf of a library and then this modern contemporary idea of the living room and um, these spaces. So that was basically what my main project was before it got very artsy uh, in fourth year. So once I finish more, then we'll start on fifth year. And I always start with this image. It's a grubby image, but it was basically my living conditions for fifth year. So I worked from home a lot because I was making messes, I was causing riots. I always preferred to work um, in my flat rather than at the studio. I just always was like that. I'd like to come into the studio to socialize. So I always came in in the evenings or like, just, uh, whenever people were drinking, I was like, yeah, hell yeah, I'll see you all then. But working time, I was mainly in uh, my room which is kind of sad but it worked for me because you know you don't have to travel that far so I was kind of already prepped for this whole corona thing um, and basically I start with this image because in fifth year uh, when you get to your master's thesis you kind of get to a point where you're like wait a minute I don't have one subject that I'm so interested in I don't know one thing that I could focus on and my tutor was just like to me was like Lisa just do what you're good at and I was like, oh, I don't really know. And he was like, just focus on what you think you could like basically make great if it was one thing you could do. And I was like, oh, well, I, I like art. And he was like, well, you could always start and approach things through painting. And I was like, OK, that's crazy. What are you talking about? No. So then I went home and I painted like 10 small. Um, I did monoprints and I'll, I'll get them up next. But these small monoprints and um, I brought them in and he was like, yep this is this is what you're going to do so it was just getting a tutor to get on board with it I think is what you need um but one thing I will say is for thesis work is do what you are good at do what you are interested in don't fake it don't force it because I don't think I would have maybe necessarily done as well if I had just done a traditional kind of building okay so I'll just touch on my master's thesis for maybe like 10 minutes or we'll see um so I was really interested in mapping and our project was in Mons in Belgium. There was 13 of us in our master's group and we all went to Belgium and got all our historic mapping. And um, I decided to kind of superimpose these as a start. At this point, I didn't really know what I was wanting to do. Um, and then through mapping, I identified a site that was basically vacant. Uh, for quite a number of years about 400 years or whatever and it's the bottom right image is the actual site that I picked which was on a historic canal um, and so from that I began to explore that site um, I took five historic maps um, initially I took nine historic maps from 1600 all the way to 2017 but then I um, narrowed it down to five historic maps that I um, focused on and 
I started to extrapolate like important kind of facets from each. So it was basically like um, a hierarchy of entrances of historic maps. So it's quite a unique, it's quite a hard one to explain, but basically the first five uh, images in the top left, you can see these were just maps from specific years of buildings that used to exist on that site. And so it was a lot of layering and approaching it through that and fragmenting pieces and using abstract art as a methodology for designing. Um, and so I'll explain where I got the rest of these from because obviously they're not all maps. Um, once I had those five um, maps, I started to uh, extrude them and I created these architectons. I did a lot of 3D modeling um the first two row well the first row in a bit are they're all um just mdf layered up painted i just wanted to like evoke a kind of a abstract art relief model study but they're actually just kind of maps basically and then i started layering them up and that's how i got these forms and these forms were initially quite random but what i noticed was that they all had a central atrium and that we weren't given a typology or anything but i just decided to employ a typology and I thought of like an atrium music school presentation space and so I used that and that kind of focused the rest of the work and um, that was all the architectons and um, they were inspired by uh, Malevich's um, and Ben Nicholson so just always artists I wasn't necessarily referring to architects and precedents in architecture I was actually more always referencing art which was always so important um this is just an example of the middle row here is um just showing how like a map from 1850 started to you know um inspire this kind of geometry for a piano room where the acoustics would be good and it all just started to flow into one and it became very 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 artsy and then it was all about routes that you would take through the site also matched up with how the acoustics would be this was a small little study on like the technical side of it but because our fourth year we had already covered the technical we didn't need to go into too much um detail on the fifth year stuff uh, and then i began to bring them all together to create capriccio sections which are just like essentially made up sections to see what forms will look like um together and i just brought these pieces of art into one and it actually started to create forms which started to create a building on the site and obviously at this point I was freaking out because I was like do I need to design a building like how everyone else is in our group and he was like no I think you're good with the methodology so it was an unusual one where I didn't end up with like an actual building it was more an exploration of the methodology um this is just in because I basically love photography and I, I took these images in the left um, of our school um, in Dundee at DJ CAD. I did these for our design research unit and um, these were just something that influenced the, the, the design basically. I didn't realize that I had such a kind of eye for black and white stuff until it was black and white stuff. Very contrasting to the artsy stuff that's coming up. Um, technical stuff, it was uh, never something I loved. So I was always a bit like, whenever I was thinking about somewhere to work in the future, I was never wanting to be on the technical side, always on the bids competition side of things for sure. Um, then I had the end capriccio sections, which were just basically my build. You can't call it a building, it wasn't a building, it was something, it was definitely something. So that was the final outcome <laughs> with these sections. And it was less so about visuals. I was like, you know, everyone loves to do a visual as their final piece, but I was like, do you know what? Mine will be spatial studies and that's it. So just imagining what these spaces could be like, but not necessarily um, going into the nitty gritty detail because it wasn't about that. It was more about the process. Uh, and then yeah there we go that was me done so you can see the project behind me it's all basically just red um left to right and it is just that exploration all methodology and it was more about the process of getting there and it was about designing a final building which was quite important to me i think um okay so then that work got put, put into quite a few like it just got entered into quite a few things and it was in the lighthouse at the architecture and design society i want to say 
uh, and then put into the RSC, which was great. And then I, I won the architecture medal at the RSC, which was fab because I wasn't actually going to go to the event. So I'm real glad I went. Uh, I didn't know it was such a big deal. I feel like I was a bit naive at this point in my, in fact, I was very naive. I didn't know what any of this stuff was. I was never super into architecture and all the stuff that you could get after it and do after it. And then I was in this and I was like, oh, I see there's more, there's more out of uni, you know? Um, so that was that, me chatting Breeze to some RSA people and uh, explaining my project. And then it was me starting at HTA. So I just threw this image in because basically when I started at um, HTA in Edinburgh um, in 2018, I, I kind of made it quite clear that I was there for to make thing to make things you know I wanted to stay creative I wanted to keep drawing every day painting if I could I knew I was doing after work but I wanted to do it in and thankfully um, my boss actually was he's he's a very talented artist and he wanted to um you know keep that going and so he gave me a lot of opportunities to draw and paint and 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 do you know things that I found interesting at work which was really important uh, so in my first week I got in and I was doing like hand-drawn sections which was really fun and unusual and I know that that isn't the opportunity for a lot of part two straight out of uni um and that was basically a lot of the work I did it was a lot most of our projects I'd say were London uh, I, I was lucky enough to be put on a Manchester project where I got to do a lot of drawings for it um Edinburgh Park which was a uh, nine months a nine month project I'm not 100% sure I didn't run this one I worked on this to create visuals illustrations I did um using like Lumion and things like that a lot of these um it's a big uh, what am I trying to say it's like a big project that HD were doing in Edinburgh and I think it's gone in for planning but again I don't know because I left so I actually haven't followed up on how Edinburgh Park is but it's right out of the airport and you get the tram there um so yeah, that was what I did. I was really lucky. I was asked to run a competition in Hounslow. I, I ran two and a half competitions that I, I left. But I I was it was quite an unusual situation where a part two was asked to run these. Um, they're around six week bids, and uh, I ran this project and basically designed it, um, working with working with a team of maybe like five or six people um, and created like, you know, illustrations and design for it, 3D printing, renders, sections, all these things. These um, were some of the drawings from it. And uh, yeah, we just did a lot of um, kind of TFL transport for London uh, was our, a lot of our, that was our client a lot of the time. So that was my time at HD. I, I uh, was quite lucky enough to run competitions, which, I think I learned a lot from and um, yes very fun to do very fun and then boom I was like I'm gonna move to New York but alas jokes on me because I'm sitting in Glasgow right now so basically I got a job uh, at KPF Associates in Manhattan and they are based on at Bryant Park so just so central and amazing and I was like I'm gonna go um, it'll be great and then boom uh, covid uh, so the same week that the lockdown uh went when the uk lockdown was put in place and um, my visa appointment was cancelled and i got coronavirus so that's me dying on the right <laughs> um trying to draw but not successfully and looking very pale um so yeah i basically had a bit of a rough two weeks where I just wasn't able to do any of the things that I was planning to do. It all came crashing down. Um, I think it was March 18th. I'm not 100% sure. And I was like, right, well, what do I do now? Because you can't just bounce back to your old company because obviously it was Corona. No one was recruiting anyone and um, no one was necessarily hiring people that they didn't know either so I didn't apply to any jobs once this happened because I was like do you know what I think I could focus on my art for a hot minute and so that I did so then it brings into the kind of lectures the artsy schmalky side of things so I just basically had an Instagram from the the October the year before so 2019 but it was just for life drawing and things like that and it was very casual and then when March 
I think it was the end of March I was like right I'm just gonna step this up just ramp up I didn't really know what to expect or what it was going to be like you don't really know these things but I just decided to start doing um just posting videos um of me drawing and things like that and just sharing it with everyone um I started obviously with all the architecture stuff so just commissions basically people sending me pictures of their house and I would draw them um definitely wasn't charging enough at the point so everyone just make sure you do when people charge you for a drawing of their house um and I was basically doing this kind of stuff just a lot of this I love doing these I this is what I love doing at uni so it was really important to me to do all this kind of stuff but um it got to a point where I was like mm, maybe I should start doing color because like impossible architecture students would use color so I was like right I'll just start doing some watercolor making everything a little bit more exciting to look at and I noticed I don't know what it is about Instagram I don't know but everyone prefers color so just so everyone knows use a little bit of color or if you're what you're in so I started doing like limited edition prints and things like that to make money um aside, uh, alongside the commissions and then I was like right I'm bored I want to mix it up I'm going to do okay so I did some I, did, I, I love nudes and, and things like that um so I was like I'm going to just start focusing on something other than architecture and just maybe like go back to my roots where at school I studied portraiture and did a lot of bodies and as I love it um and that's Ashley Gray, Ashley Graham on the left and she's I don't know what she is but she is a plus size model in America and she retweeted the, this picture to 11 million people and I think that's kind of where the whole Instagram social media thing really blows up um so then I took a little bit of a day where I was like you know what I'm going to do something a bit different and I started some abstract fun and it, it really blew up everyone just really enjoyed abstract stuff and I had never were done people started buying them and I was like right I gotta make this into a kind of official business now so then I had to get a spreadsheet on the go um which really means you're in a business um and yeah I just basically started painting doing commissions for people they would give me a color palette specific things that they wanted and I would I would make these abstracts abstract paintings for them uh, and um it's now got to a stage where the commissions the scale of them are huge like these are big paintings um I don't know what this one is 460 by 40 these are two like a dual canvas for like a client in London I've got the clientele that you can reach on Instagram is unreal so there's like you know most of my I would say 55% of my clientele is American and I don't know necessarily why that is I have a lot of friends obviously in America who must be sharing it and things like that but maybe it is also because Americans have a lot of disposable income and um, so I get a lot of commissions and a lot of my um um, clients are in America this was a client who basically had a very specific brief and I followed suit trying to keep in my tones and colors but um just creating paintings um for people which is like the dream and kind of what I've always wanted to do I didn't necessarily think that you could do that or you could make a living doing that and I think if it hadn't obviously been for corona you obviously like this you might not have like even risked trying it because people are so concerned about making money but it ended up that I was making more money as an artist than I was as a part two so I was like right I'm gonna keep trucking with this because um I never thought it was possible but it actually is I think you do need to stay like on the bandwagon with clients though because I think if that drops off say January when no one's buying stuff it will be a bit uncertain money but run up to Christmas you know it's a good business to be in if anyone has a side hustle in it um and it's me and that's the chat about it and that is my current studio which is to the left of me and uh basically if anyone has any specific questions we can have a wee chat about stuff um yeah um so just taking us off mute here if you stop sharing your screen and then we'll yeah. get to got the questions ready on his laptop we'll ask you a few on the spot questions okay <laughs> okay so we have six questions here 
And so the first one is, how do you see your business developing in the future? And do you think you'd like to concentrate on your art long term? Yeah, I think I would definitely like to concentrate on my art long term. There was a point in June where I was like, nah, get me back to architecture ASAP. I would like a steady salary. It would just be easier. Um, and it's where, you know, it's where I know that I'm comfortable and I can do the job. But I think even if I went back to architecture uh, full time, I think that I would definitely keep this up and it is something quite to I would for it so I think the direction that I would hope it would go in would maybe be where I'm uh, maybe in an exhibition or something I haven't been in an exhibition since the RSA um, so that would be quite exciting I haven't produced a body of work though that is for an exhibition yet so I haven't been sat working on anything that I'm trying to get into a, a um, an art gallery or anything so I think I need to get on top of that first and that's the direction I would see it going in. Um, did you ever feel pressure to work in architecture after six to seven years of study or was branching into art always something you wanted to do? Um, I was never going to branch into art. Oh, was there another part of that? The follow-up question. Uh, did you ever see yourself moving back to architecture or working in an art architect's office again? Okay, well, I answered that one just there. So yeah, I probably, I think I probably would because it is where I'm kind of not comfortable, but I think it will be, but I think the art will always be there. Um, no, I never, ever, ever, ever thought that I would not, sorry, I never thought I would be an artist full time. And I think, like I say, if it wasn't for the pandemic, I don't think I would have taken the risk myself. I don't think I had enough confidence in myself to just stop like your stop your career basically because why a lot of people think you know you have to study architecture sorry you have to be an architect if you're studying architecture but since first year of uni everyone hated me in my year because I was like well they didn't hate me but everyone was like oh shut up because I didn't want to do I didn't want to be an architect ever but I always was like I'll just keep trucking at it and then it got to fifth year and I was doing quite well in it and I was like oh maybe I enjoy it but actually I think what I enjoyed was the art side of it always and so yeah even though everyone came into architecture very enthusiastic knowing that they wanted to be architects because they were the loyals from the start they're like I'm gonna do this till I die and I was like you know I'm not but I didn't know how I didn't know that it was going to direct me towards art basically but I would never get rid of like the architectural commissions and things like that or that I wouldn't lose that style of drawing sketching because it's quite important and I do I can appreciate architecture but I'm not I I was never a, like kind of architecture geek all my friends loved looking at precedents loved looking they would like they had art daily on their computer and I didn't use art daily I didn't use anything I didn't use architecture precedents I didn't use anything and I never referred to buildings which was my first mistake I never referred to other people's work I also didn't go to crits. <laughs> that was a rookie error. Um, sorry, I don't know if I'm cutting out, but it says my internet connection's not good. Um, but yeah, I basically was one of those people that was always a bit doubtful of architecture. So I'm quite, it's not completely surprising that I've left it this early, but equally, I'm not saying I wouldn't return. Um, you've sort of answered this one, but how do most of your commissions come about? And do you ever plan to put on an exhibition? Ooh, so yeah, the exhibition, ideally, yes. I'll need to figure that one out. Um, most of the commissions come about from Instagram. It's amazing what Instagram can do. So I, I wasn't big on it until last year. I wasn't even big on it last year, what am I saying? Uh, I really wasn't. I didn't even use it that well for social stuff. Like I, I honestly barely uploaded a picture and all that. And now I'm like, oh God, I need to post. And it's just, it takes over your life. But it's all Instagram. So I'm trying to think. The only times it's not come through Instagram is when it's like a mutual, oh, it's a friend of a friend and they've just moved into a nice house and they want a painting um, or they know me already. But uh, they just slide, people just slide into the DMs and go, hey, can we do stuff? And I'm like, hey, we'll have a chat about it. So I get them on WhatsApp and then we'll either have a FaceTime and I'll we'll chat through specifics of what they want for their commission because it could be anything really. Um. Are you able to take inspiration for the, 
from the built environment and apply it to your artwork or where does your in inspiration come from? Mm, that is a very good question. It's a very architectural question. <laughs> um, I've been sat here uh, around about April, May, where I started doing the abstract pieces and I was like, God, I wish there was a way to bring my architecture like skills, the built environment, the urban kind of aspect of it into my art. And don't get me wrong, there will be something and I'll hit it at some point, but I have not found it yet where I'm like, I know how to bring the two together. I've been trying to bring the two together for what, five, six years and I'm still like, what part of it do I value the most? Is it just the aesthetic part of architecture? You know, how a building looks and things like that. And I think for me it is quite shallow to that point where I'm like, it's more about how it appears than how it's built or constructed. Um, there are a couple of artists that I see out there that do, that they've dabbled in kind of bringing in the built environment with their art, but then that always goes far too kind of technical and you can make mistakes and it's all about getting stuff to scale and perspective and I actually have really enjoyed the kind of looseness of art and not having the rules of architecture which honestly it's the way that the degree was uh, you guys will know is just that it you can get it wrong whereas art you can't really get it wrong I mean you can it could look like trash but <laughs> no one can tell you no one can actually go oh that's incorrect whereas you sit down at a crit and an architect or like one of your tutors will be like that's wrong um so I would rather people couldn't look at my art and go that's incorrect um and they could maybe just more be like oh I see where you're going with it um but yeah that's probably I hope that's answered that I don't know if it has um <laughs> One last question. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the support for freelance artists by the government during the COVID pandemic? And what are your thoughts on the recent statements that encourages people in the arts to retrain for other jobs? Oh, I love that. I was having a good I was having a good giggle about that one. I think that's just funny. It's the guy who said it's obviously doesn't have a an appreciation for the fact that he probably listens, watches sees art every single day so he's just an idiot but I think in general the government it's quite weird because I can't complain too much in my personal situation this is this weird this pandemic given me a chance to be an artist and spend time doing an artist but if I was paying rent right this second I would be like freaking I mean I've definitely tried to make more money out of it than make the art nice just to like pay for food and things like that and um, so in that respect I think a lot of freelance artists like myself are like oh I need to make money because you know no one's getting any income no one's getting um, grants or anything like that I haven't seen a great amount from the government for creatives I've seen a lot on Instagram but you have to apply for them and only a certain amount of people get them and I'm like well how do you know how much uh, say someone who makes scrunchies should get or how much someone who you know has like a sustainable like I don't know I'm trying to think of a really rogue like necklace gold necklace making business there's just so many creatives out there I don't necessarily think that the government are gonna go for them because because they're so small everyone's just so small and, and and things but I think it's quite important that we all try and like shop small this Christmas no one's going anywhere no one's doing anything there's no point in being all crazy with your gifts I think it's like this is the year where you do shop locally you shop with Instagram artists maybe um I think personally I've been a little bit like oh would I buy something on Instagram like would I actually message someone some random person and go yo can I get a necklace like you have to think what what direction are we going in and I think that's the direction that we're going in and the government may not help with that but I think if you just spread the word that we should shop locally, then I think that would be quite a good shout, even if the government didn't give you, you know, a grant or like subsidize anything. So, yeah. Okay, I think that's all of our questions, yeah? yeah? Yeah. So, I'd just like to give you a final thank you. We are obsessed with you. That was so good. Oh, wow. Thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> I'm sure everyone at home is agreeing with us that that was a really good first 5710 for us. Um, and if you want to follow Louisa on her art account, uh, you can go onto our 5710 
Instagram account and we've tagged her in all of our recent posts. So you'll see her there. Um, so yeah, I would suggest you do that. It's a very good account. And Thanks, thank you again. And everyone go buy some of Louise's art. <laughs> yeah, just slide into my DMs, guys. Fill it up. I got a lot on. <laughs> Six week waiting list, but come join. Come join. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much again. But uh, we'll end the call there. And okay. Get back to your painting and whatnot. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Right. Thank Bye. you. Bye.